morning to everybody and as we uh, are together this morning the rain is falling outside you might um, you might hear it falling it's lovely rain uh, during the springtime and welcome to everybody we continue to pray for Colin Penn and for Eunice Orenser who are still uh, not well uh, and also this coming Saturday is our market the first one in six months so I hope you can join us at St Olaf's um, for the market and this coming Sunday, uh, which is a communion Sunday at all three services, but of course the 9.15 service now reverts to 9.30 because we're doing tea after each of the services. So it's 8 o'clock, 9.30 and 5, and it's lovely to see folks um, slowly trickling back to our services. Now we continue with Mark's Gospel today, Portraits of Jesus. I want to have a look at a little paragraph towards the end of Mark chapter 1, which shows us something about Jesus and his mercy. A key verse in understanding Mark's gospel is Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that verse summarizes the two main themes in Mark's gospel, which are Christ's service, which occupies most of the book, and then, of course, Christ's sacrifice, which occupies the last three chapters. But alongside those two themes, Mark's Gospel contains more of the miracles of Jesus than the other Gospels. And all of, them, all of the miracles of Christ are showing the effect of the work of the Spirit. What happened when Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, came? So, for example, when he healed the blind, it portrays He's bringing light to darkened hearts. When he calmed the storm, it shows his power to bring peace to troubled hearts. When he raised the, de the dead, it proclaims his life-giving power. And so Mark is a book of deep spiritual teaching. And so here in Mark chapter 1 from verse 29 to verse 34, we're going to spend a few moments inside the heart of the healer. And let me read these few verses to you. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. And so he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. We'll read as far as that for uh, just for the moment. So the four new disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they must have been really excited when they went with Jesus to Peter's house for the Sabbath meal. They'd been amazed by what they had seen and heard in the short time they'd already been with him. And it was normal to have the main Sabbath meal straight after synagogue at midday. And just by the way, Peter was married. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5. But when they got to the house, instead of a delicious hot Sabbath meal, they found a sick cook. And almost certainly Peter had no idea that his mother-in-law had fallen ill. But there she was, sick with a fever, and sadly she's too sick to do anything. And then verse 31 tells us that Jesus took her by the hand and helped her up. Luke says in a parallel account that he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And Matthew says in Matthew 8 simply that he touched her. So we have an overall picture of the Lord Jesus standing close to the bed, taking her by the hand, rebuking the fever, gently raising her up before Peter and his wide-eyed friends. The point, of course, is that Jesus could have healed her any way he chose to. In fact, the Gospels tell us that at times he did miracles with a simple word, at other times with something as complicated as clay made with spittle or an instruction to go and wash in the Siloam. He could do them any way that he wished. The reason for the different ways in which he healed people rested in the mental and moral condition of the people themselves and what it was that he wanted to communicate to them. But here he is reaching down, he's taking a, 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 a dear woman by the hand. It's just a simple and natural reaction springing from the sympathetic heart of Jesus. His extended hand was an expression of his genuine love, his desire to meet a sick woman's need. And it speaks volumes about how much he cares for us. 
and how much Jesus loves us. And this is what he wants to do with each person, both with those who do not yet know him and also with those of us who do know him. All who need a touch of grace. And that ought to bring great comfort to our hearts. And then we notice the response of Peter's mother-in-law that she immediately got up and she began to wait on them. And that's a sure sign that she's received complete healing from the touch of Jesus. And I'm sure that she would have done her very best to help her guests. But more important, there would have been in that house on that Sabbath afternoon, shouts of joy and praise and laughter because the power of the Lord had been seen. And the joy and excitement would have been felt all around the streets of Capernaum as what had happened in, uh, to Peter's mother-in-law would have no doubt filtered out through the streets. And it would have continued until the shadows began to lengthen and the darkness of the evening set in. And that brings us to our second point today as we think about Jesus and his mercy. We look in verses 32 to 34 at Jesus' healings at night. And so the paragraph continues, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And so as evening approached, an air of anticipation settles in over this town uh, on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. The Sabbath is over, and that meant that the sick and the needy could now be brought to Jesus without the law being broken. The law said that the Sabbath ended when the three stars came out and the night sky. And so when the sun had set and the stars were blinking above, the people poured out and came to the house where Jesus was. And as we've read in those verses, verses 32 and 30, 33, we get the picture. In fact, the tenses used in the Greek language in which the Gospel of Mark is written, those tenses show person after person arriving at the door so that there was a surging mass of crippled and diseased people coming with their friends. And Jesus responds by healing many. Verse 34 says that Jesus healed many who had various diseases and he also drove out many demons. And so what a wonderful evening it was. The demons fled, the bedridden threw away their mattresses and crutches, the mentally deranged were lucid, the onlookers were overcome with joy. But we need to pause because we shouldn't be naive about what is going on here. Many people came simply because they wanted something from Jesus. And we can respond, as I do, by saying, well, who can blame them? Those who've been riddled with pain and disease for many years without any relief. Of course they're going to come to someone who is proving to be a genuine miracle worker. We sympathize with those who have real disabilities both then and today. Pain is a terrible thing to live with day after day, month after month. But as I say, we also need to pause and be a little bit careful here. This is the same Jesus who, just a bit earlier in the middle of Mark chapter 1, had announced that his main message is to believe and repent in order to find forgiveness. Many of these people are only thinking of relief from their pain and their affliction, but not about an ongoing relationship with God. It's much the same today, sadly, in many circles. Jesus is presented as a kind of a, a miracle worker who can make us wealthy or he can give us prestige and status. It's natural for us human beings to want a magic Jesus. But we must remember that God is not someone to be used, that he is to be loved and worshipped and served regardless of comes our way, what comes our way in the world. And Jesus certainly knew what was in the hearts of men and women. He was used by people. But it's against that reality that we also see his heart because he genuinely cared about the physical needs of people. And he still does today, whatever their motivations were. He wanted to lead them back to God. So he healed them, hoping that they would also listen to his words 
of truth and grace and reality and come back into right relationship with God through him. So Jesus has a kind heart. He never tires in reaching out to us in love and concern. What we also learn early on in his ministry here in Capernaum, and his disciples had to learn it, and we have to learn it, is that Jesus was not interested in the praise and acclaim that was offered to him. He was not impressed by the large crowds that gathered to hear him and watch him. He insisted on moving on. We read further towards the end of the chapter, Mark chapter 1 in verse 38. He says, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also because that is why I have come. And so he carried on with his greatest priority, which is preaching the gospel of belief and repentance. Now Jesus is still able to heal today, and he does, but he knows that even those who are wonderfully and miraculously healed will, at some point in the future, eventually die, just as we all will die. And that's why throughout his ministry, Jesus emphasized the need for salvation. And that's why he also wants to heal us, not just from our physical ailments, but he wants to heal us from our internal ailments, from bitterness and hatred and anger and lust and gossip and harshness and all those things that spring from the inside. And so to anyone who doesn't know Christ, we hold out to you the healing heart of Christ. If you are not yet a believer, can there be anything more attractive to you than the heart of the Son of God who loves you and cares for you, especially as we now live in this cold, post-COVID, impersonal world? And as believers, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to produce Christ's heart in us. So let's pause for a moment. Let's pray. Let's think of those who are in need of our prayers. And let's hold out the healing heart of Christ to them. Lord, we pray for those that we know who are in need of physical healing. We pray again today so much for Colin and Barbara, who's looking after him, uh, for Eunice, and for others, Lord, we know who live with incessant and constant pain. Lord, be with each one of them, we pray, and bring release and freedom and healing to their bodies. But Lord, we also pray for those who are in need of healing of their hearts. Lord, they need salvation. They need spiritual healing. They need your grace and your love to be poured into their hearts. We know that you can do that because you have said that the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts as we turn to him. And Lord, we know many people who are in need of the healing love of Christ. And we pray for each one. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.